Welcome to the Sales Podcast, Session 72, the Wrestling CPA Podcasting Edition. Huh? Welcome to the Sales Podcast, the 72nd edition. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Finally coming at you a few days late, and my first... Uh, Sinus infection in years, and this one was a bad one. Knocked me out, fever, had to get antibiotics, the whole nine yards. Spent uh, the weekend of Father's Day laid up. But hey, we're back at it. Today we've got an interesting guest, uh, Dan Franks. As you'll hear in the interview, he was a professional wrestler who became a CPA, of course, because that's what wrestlers do. Um, and then is an entrepreneur, podcaster, and he has started the podcast movement. He's a co-founder of that, and I will be attending uh, in August in Dallas. If you want to head on over to podcastmovement.com and use promo code WES, he has offered 15% off uh, to our listeners. Very gracious of him. So with the wrestler in mind, today's joke goes like this. You know, Dan was walking home. Uh, late one evening, and you know Dallas, Fort Worth. It's a big city. Overall, it's pretty safe, but hey, it's a big city. And he got he got jumped by a uh, you know a mugger, and man, they fought and they fought and they fought. Fifteen minutes go by, and finally, though, uh, this mugger was too big for him. Finally, pinned Dan down, uh, rummages through all of his pockets, and all he can find is five dollars and fifteen cents. And he says, "Man, you put up a fight like that for five dollars and fifteen cents." Dan says, oh, no, man, I thought you were after the $500 in my boots. That's pretty bad, huh? All right, so before we get into the interview, here is the sales podcast creed. Today is my day. I work diligently towards my goals, which are bigger than me. I bite off more than I can chew because only then will I truly know my current limits and surpassing them becomes my new goal for today. Through education, accountability partners, and bold, decisive action, today will be better than yesterday. And tomorrow will be better yet. I'm ready to produce. So now, without further ado, Mr. Dan Franks. Dan Franks, all the way from Texas, founder of the inaugural podcast movement. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How are you? What's going on, Wes? So I, I don't know if I should be nervous or if you should be nervous because, you know, on the one hand, you're the founder of the podcast movement. So, you know, I got to have my ducks in a row. But conversely, you're the founder of the podcast movement. You better have your ducks in a row. So who should be nervous here? You know what? I think we should both be nervous. How about that? Oh, dude, that's like so awkward and uncomfortable. How about if neither of us are, are uncomfortable? You know, six of one, half dozen of the other. If we're going to take the optimistic approach here, then I'm okay with that. All right. Very nice. So for our listeners that may not know who you are, would you mind taking a moment or two and give us the, the lowdown on Dan Franks? Yeah, man, I'm a little bit of everything. I uh, started in online business, if you want to call it that, when I was about 13 years old, which was, God, 15 years ago now. I was making websites for professional wrestlers here in Texas, which is uh, really of one, of the, one of the most random things anyone <laughs> could uh, come out and say. But yeah, I, was, um, I had mailbox money coming in when I was about 13 from these online websites I was building. And uh, fast forward... 15 years or so, and now I'm a CPA working with a whole lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners doing their, their tax consultations and making sure they've got all their ducks in a row. And uh, like you mentioned, Podcast Movement, the National Podcasting Conference, I'm a co-founder of and, and heading up a lot of the planning and uh, putting together of that thing. So a lot of different things going on. And of course, I podcast or else it would it be uh, it would kind of be a little weird for me to run the podcast movement and not have any involvement with podcasting. So I do that as well. So, yeah, uh, not too much going on. Okay, so you're a whiz kid, teenager, building websites for wrestlers, and then you become a CPA and start podcasting. That's also very obvious. It's a very natural path. It makes sense, right? I oh, mean, yeah. that, oh, how else would that have ended up? And then along the way there, I actually applied my craft at professional wrestling as well, so throw another curveball in there oh is that why you look so tough in your pictures i mean you got blue socks and white sharks but i mean you I, you have this kind of aura of like bad acidness so like i didn't want to say anything yeah you know when you've spent 10 years or so flying around the wrestling ring and getting your your face kicked in and having to show up for either class the next day or show up in in meetings with clients the next day with black eyes or, or chipped teeth you kind of you get that sense about yourself after a while <laughs> 
So uh, <laughs> are you one of those guys that, like, would bust Geraldo Rivera in the mouth? Did, did, did you ever see that when he was- Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, what was it? it was John Stossel, though. That's who it oh, was. Oh, Stossel. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, so that was about 20 years before my time. Things, you know, by the time I came around, it was a little more accepted that it was entertainment and you weren't trying to – defend the legitimacy of the sport that was going on in the ring people were more accepting of the fact that you could admit it was entertainment and not a real fight in there and everyone could be happy at that point so so like as a cpa when people say taxes aren't real do you like you you throw your like your hp 10b calculator at them yep the 10 key over the head there you go or you get that big yeti microphone podcasting it in real wham yeah, there you go, and uh, yeah, a, a, a microphone tripod through the face. So there you go. Are you charging like VIP, like safe seating at the podcast movement? So like for people that won't get hit with a Yeti microphone, or is that is that extra? Well, so I'm going to try to stay off the stage as much as possible, so people <laughs> might be safe. But you know, I haven't vetted the background checks of many of our speakers yet, so you never know. That might be something that you could just uh, plan on uh, doing just to be safe. Well, we will be in Texas, so there's plenty of uh, chicken coop wires and, and mesh and, and barbed wire, so I mean, we can like, See, make our own safety net, right? Th- that's not fair. That's not fair to do that to Texas. We just got done talking before you hit record. You're, you've spent your fair share of time in I, Texas. I so. did, and I know. I know where to get all that stuff. <laughs> That that doesn't mean we've got you know okay okay if you come to podcast movement and you're in the middle you're the heart of Dallas you're not going to see any chicken coops or you're not going to see anyone riding their horse <laughs> down the street if that's what you're expecting anyone listening I'm sorry to disappoint you Wes I think you're being a little unfair to Texas but if you drive 20 minutes north I will give a personal tour of South Fork and you can see where Jr was shot I have been there, there. you go there you go and so yeah we're we're not too far from there there you go all right so man so walk us through this I mean. This is a unique kind of uh, turn of events. But I guess in a way maybe it's not because people don't realize, maybe they do now when more and more people try to do their own websites, even with WordPress and things like that. Building a site uh, is hard. Uh, there's a lot of attention to detail. So, I mean, it, was that kind of your background, I guess, and, and that kind of naturally led into accounting, which is obviously a great attention to detail? Yeah, you know, and, and you mentioned the WordPress, things like that. Those things, if they existed back then, I didn't know about them. Most they, they websites, most websites, especially whatever that was, uh, mid '90s, somewhere in there, mid to late '90s, most websites were HTML based. You had some Java and CGI and some of these other scripts going on, but for the most part, generic websites were HTML based. So I did the thing that everyone else did, right? I learned HTML code and put all that together. So I guess that's very detail based. And now when I Re- I say recently, more recently, got back into putting together websites again and using WordPress. It's, it's a completely different world. I, I couldn't imagine the things I could have done if something like WordPress were around back then. I just think about how long it took me to do such basic things that now it takes me no time at all. And if you mess something up, you can just quickly change it back then. It was a, a big ordeal. But you know, I, I think maybe that attention to detail did lead in or, or you know go hand in hand with my CPA type personality, if you want to call it that. So yeah, I guess, I guess the, this muddy story maybe clears up a little bit if you want to look at it like that. And then, so do you have your own firm? Are you working for somebody or what are you doing? Yeah. So I like to use the Chris Brogan or the James Altucher term of an employeepreneur. So I work for a small firm here in Dallas, but it's very much uh, empowering to its employees. We, we keep our own clients. We deal, you know, we deal one-on-one on a daily basis with, with our own clients, not necessarily working with these large conglomerates and being a piece of the, of the machine, like some of these other large firms. And so what that does is it gives me that sense of almost being an entrepreneur, but I have the, you know, the infrastructure of this bigger firm and the tools and the resources that I don't have to just be stringing things together on a shoestring budget. The infrastructure is there. So it's kind of the best of the both worlds to me. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, Hey, I, I got started in corporate America. You know, I, I was in the air force, you know, and I got married, had a family before I figured out this whole entrepreneurial thing. So I couldn't just uh, you know, go sleep on the buddy's couch in the basement and try to figure this out. I mean, I had to, I had to put a roof over the heads and, you know, bacon on the table, uh, while I figured it out. So that's cool that, that they are that flexible. Uh, what, what did you call it? Employeepreneur? 
Yeah, so that's yeah. what uh, Brogan and Altucher call it. So that and they're, those are the first two that I've heard use that term. They might not have coined it, but yeah. to me, to me, they've brought it to the forefront. And I never knew there was a term for what I did and how I kind of viewed what I'm doing. But when I read that, I was like, yeah, that that makes sense. I like that. So, all right. So, who died and made you king? Right? Who anointed you to make the podcast movement? Obviously, somebody like Congress probably passed a bill and and you know sent it to you and, and anointed you, right? Yeah, you know, politics are a little funny here in Texas, so <laughs> that I'm not going to say that didn't happen. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, uh, it started about. A year ago now, there was a PodCamp Dallas, and if anyone's familiar with PodCamp, it's kind of small, regional, little podcasting, day-long conferences that are kind of it, – it's it's a grassroots effort, I guess you could call it, this PodCamp. It's free to license this name and use in your own town if you want to put together small podcasting conferences just with local podcasters. Uh, and there was one in Dallas put on by a guy named Gary Leland last summer, uh, summer 2013, and it was – you know. 20 or 30 people there and five or six speakers there. So it really was almost more like a meetup than anything else, a meetup with different presenters and things. And that's how I was introduced to Gary Leland and Mitch Todd, who ultimately became two of my partners in podcast movement. And then you fast forward to January 2014, where New Media Expo was in Las Vegas. And if anyone's not familiar with New Media Expo, it's kind of the biggest conference for bloggers and podcasters and web TV producers, all these people that are producing this online media to kind of get together and meld ideas and mash up and also kind of practice and learn some more things about their own specific craft. And I got there and Jared Easley, who was another co-founder of mine, he and I had kind of an online relationship. We had gotten to know one another and we met there and got to talking and Gary Leland, the guy that ran PodCamp Dallas was also there. And we all all just kind of sat around talking and realized, you know, why are these things not uh, going together? Why can there not be this podcast only conference like the PodCamp Gary was doing, but at a much larger level, something almost as big as New Media Expo, where people come from all over the world to go to this New Media Expo? And we really almost had that aha moment where we saw this void in the in the market for a podcast only conference. There's thousands of podcasters at New Media Expo. And a lot of the complaints we heard was that there wasn't enough attention to detail on the podcasting track. So all these podcasters were there, but a lot of the people didn't really feel like they were getting their value, their money's worth, and their time's worth for being there. So we saw all this energy, and we just kind of jumped on it. We figured no one else is doing it. Why not us? Sure. So the four of us just got together and started putting together the plan, and that's where the initial concept came from. So from the time you all had that idea, so I mean that was like January, right? Yeah, so uh, you know, as soon as we all got home, and you know, a lot of people got sick at New Media Expo this year, and I don't, I don't know what that means, but that might have been another sign that maybe there needed to be something else going on. <laughs> but I think like seventy five percent of the people I knew, I'd say three out of every four people I knew that were there got oh, it sick. Was crazy, so, oh. like John John Lee Dumas got sick, and we we met for lunch uh, right after, and he was just recovering. Pat Flynn was still sick, couldn't meet us for lunch. I think Amy Porterfield, got, everybody I know got sick. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was really weird and ridiculous. I, I don't know what was happening, but after every one of the of our group kind of uh, got their stomach set a little bit, a little bit, we all got together and started talking this over and really hashing through details. And the biggest thing that we wanted to prove to ourselves is this whole proof of concept or trying to determine what the viability of what what we had in our heads was because. You know, a lot of times you get these ideas in your head and they sound good to you putting them together because it's your, you know, it's what you've come up with. But actually trying to get outside opinions, that's where a lot of times where things fall through, where it doesn't sound as great to everyone else. So we started trying to decide how we were going to vet this idea, how we were going to make sure that it was actually something worth putting our time and effort and money towards. And ultimately we came up with the idea, why not crowdsource it? Why not figure out what the least we need to run the very bare bones conference that we have in mind is. And then let's start a Kickstarter campaign with that amount as our goal. And if we can get that goal within 30 days, you know, February to March, somewhere in that window, then if we're doing something later in the summer, if we can just get that minimum goal in 30 days, certainly we can, you know, maybe double that or something over the course of the summer to actually put together a decent conference. So that's really how we came up with the idea to do a Kickstarter campaign is just to vet the idea and make sure it was something that people out there wanted. And that's 
where we, you know, actually put the foot on the gas and started driving forward. All right. So you attend New Media Expo first week of January this year, 2014. Uh, so by February, y'all had agreed to do the Kickstarter? Correct. And it was in February when it launched and the 30 days elapsed uh, sometime in March. Okay. And what was your goal on that uh, dollar-wise? So the building that we found here in Dallas that we initially decided we would try to do the conference at, which to us, this was a stretch at the time, uh, it cost $10,000 for the two days at the building. And that was very bare bones, not, not much to it, but it was enough to get the building. So we set the Kickstarter goal at $11,000 because if anyone doesn't know, Kickstarter takes like 10% of your whatever you get contributed to you. So we had to figure out what we needed to set it at to get the 10000 at the end of the day. And we decided, yeah, that $10,000, if we can get that in 30 days, we'll be good to go. We'll push forward and we'll have ourselves our small little conference. Okay. Well, we got that $11,000 in less than 24 hours of going oh. live. And from there, we ended up getting to 33000 Somewhere in there was our final number. So we, we did a little better than expected, even a little better than ha- we had hoped in those first 30 days. And from there, it's just kind of – it's gone, you know, taken off. And I get, you know, that's really a, what we wanted. We wanted the proof of concept, and we certainly had that. Uh, so what do you do with that extra money? Well, do so – Whatever we, you want. <laughs> you know that that would be the good that would be the good answer is just <laughs> uh, but the truth is that initial building we had secured while it might have been big enough to cram three hundred four hundred people in there, it was going to be tough, plus there wasn't a huge common area, so anytime yeah. anytime the classroom's cleared, there's going to be some people standing outside if we tried to cram that large number of people in there, and anyone who spent any amount of time in August in Texas knows that the least amount of time you can spend outside, the better. Oh, come on. This will show the tough one. I say we do tequila shots every hour in the sun and have the conference outside. Well, you know, that's still an option. Not the conference outside, but tequila shots in the sun. We're not holding anyone back from that. So if that's your idea of a good time, we'd love for you to come and buy your tickets to Podcast Movement. And if that's what you want to do, uh, Wes will join you. He's already made it sound like he will. So No, you have to leave it, man. <laughs> well, I, I, joke I, did say I, wasn't, I, I did say I wasn't going to be on the stage, so I guess I have to do something with you myself. you got to be somewhere. Come on. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah, so once those numbers grew so quick and we had more people in the thir- first 30 days buy tickets than would fit in that building, obviously we had to kind of circle back up and figure out, well, now we have more money than we expected, but we have a lot more people than we expected. So we had to figure out a new place to do this event that we've already sold tickets to. So now we've sold more tickets than the space we have. And Saturdays in, in Dallas – trying to find venues for any kind of event, it's really tough because there's weddings every Saturday night and wedding receptions every Saturday night. So every conference room and ballroom and venue in Dallas was almost booked up by then because those things sometimes get booked up 15, 18 months in advance. Right. So we started – we had to figure out some different ways to look around, find some available venues, and we found one, the West End Gallery of Dallas, which is kind of the center of – uh, commercial. It, it's a mall. It's a skating rink. It's a hotel. It's a conference center. It's kind of a, a big all-in-one place in uh, kind of central Dallas area, just a little north of downtown. And they ended up having availability for a group of our size. They had a perfect setup. Um, it's a hotel as well, so we were able to double dip and have the hotel and the conference in the same place. And to answer your question, that's where all the money is going, is is now the, the new venue, the new hotel, the new everything. And we, other thing we had to do with this money is we really decided, well, if we have this money, this money is not going to be put to good use just going back into our pockets. That would be great for this year, but we're really trying to build something that's going to go year after year and really build on itself. And one of the people that we've been kind of mentoring with, his name is Philip Taylor, and he's the organizer of the FinCon conference, uh, which focuses on financial bloggers, financial podcasters. He's been going about four or five years with that conference. And we've – he uh, lives about 10 minutes from me here, ironically enough. But his conference started somewhat similarly, a very a small size for a niche-type group. And it's grown and grown and grown until it's very big and very successful now. And one of the biggest points of advice he gave us was don't try to skim a little bit of profit off the first year just for the sake of having a profit. He said his biggest 
regret was that first year not reinvesting all the money to make the conference as good as it could be the first year because it's only going to compound from there. So the better the first year is, the better the second year is going to be and so on and so forth. So he really encouraged us if we do sell more tickets than we originally planned on to figure out good quality ways to make the conference experience better. And so that's really what we aim at doing, uh, aimed and continue to aim at doing as the tickets keep selling and the money keeps coming in. And one of the big things that a lot of people talk to us about that they did enjoy about New Media Expo was the networking aspect, the events that not weren't 100% related to the conference itself. They weren't the presentations, but these ancillary events that were going on, most of which were not sponsored by the conference itself. And they all said it would be really cool if the conference sponsored something like that so that there aren't three or four or ten different things going on across the city where – People are pulled. Where do they want to go? Do they, you know, are they going to meet these people over there? Are these people over there? The people really liked the idea of doing something uh, put on by the conference, but that wasn't the conference itself, so that everyone could come to one central place, but really be outside that conference, outside that meeting element, and really socialize there. So one of the things we're really putting a lot of money towards is the Saturday night of the event. We've rented out the entire House of Blues in Dallas, which is a, a big stage and a big uh, flooring area and lounge area. And there's three bars around the room, really big production type space. And we've rented that whole place out and we're going to bus everybody over after the after the sessions on Saturday, give people time to go back to the room and get changed. And everyone's getting bussed over to the House of Blues in Dallas for our big, uh, a big party there. And it's going to be a, a really fun event. We're going to have live stage entertainment. We're going to we're working on all different types of things up there and different fun things going on around the venue itself as well as uh, free drinks for people and free food so that's something that people really expressed to us that they wanted to see and with that extra money that's something we're able to do so we're really excited about that kind of thing um yeah that's all fantastic i mean you you had an idea you pulled the trigger uh you're networking with more experienced people right standing on the shoulders of giants so you don't have to make all the same mistakes um, throwing, doing this through Kickstarter, so you're, you're minimizing your financial exposure. I mean, it just sounds like you're doing everything right. I mean, kudos to you, man. This, I mean, this sounds fantastic. Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I'm waiting for something to to crash down, and you know, little things come up along the way. There's all kinds of things that you just don't expect. Oh, yeah. uh, people always, are, you know, people tend to i say people in general some people always have something to complain about no matter what you do for and who you do it for there's always some people are going to find something wrong and and since we went in a little bit about my wrestler thing i'll go ahead and just say the the most recent email that i saw today right before you and i hopped on here was somebody emailed a partner of mine and said well I really would go to the conference, but I don't like the kind of people that you're putting it on with. And he linked to a video of me 10 years ago wrestling and uh, <laughs> something about that. And and I, I don't know what his reply was, but it should have been, you know, good. We don't want you there kind of thing because it's really silly to um, to do, for that kind of thing to happen. But it, it's those types of things that you wouldn't you wouldn't predict would come up as an issue or – you know, all kinds of things that you just don't know are going to happen until they do happen. And as long as they stay little and, and, you know, minimal impact like things like that, then I'll be great. But, you know, first year conferences, things are going to happen. We're kind of accepting the fact that something's going to happen that we aren't prepared for. But I think a lot of times when people know that you're genuinely into it and you're trying to do the best thing, they're going to be a lot more forgiving than you know, if you're not open and you're not, you're not willing to kind of accept the or, or admit those mistakes are going to happen. You know, talking with guys like you or or on on other podcasts and other blogs when I'm talking to people, I'm not afraid to say, "Hey, prepare yourself for something, hopefully minor, but something to happen that we weren't prepared for, and we're apologizing in advance." But you know what? We're gonna not do it again, and we're gonna continue to try to do some, do the best thing possible. And hopefully at the end of the day, everyone feels like they got their time and money's worth and everyone's happy. Yeah. I mean, right now, what are the tickets? 129 bucks, 149, including uh, house of blues. Yeah. So all the ticket prices recently that those were the early bird rates. They've gone up $40 each, which, nice. which in still. my opinion, is still pretty cheap for everything included. And, and one thing, and another thing that a lot of people complained about from New Media Expo, which not picking on them at all, but that was our experience of a big similarly typed 
uh, event. So we talked to a lot of people that we met there about what they would like to see different so that we can learn from others' mistakes. And one of the big things that people said was, well, if there was four different sessions going on at a time and I wanted to see them all, I didn't really have that option unless I wanted to pay another $1,000 for this virtual ticket to watch all the recordings. And they said that would be really cool if you could include that in the cost of the regular ticket. So that's exactly what we're doing. Every ticket of for people that are in person also comes with the recording of the 40 plus sessions on video that they can log into anytime after the event and watch it. So, you know, just, just that we're, I think that's the one takeaway I've had that I'm learning from this experience that I'll certainly take forward into any other projects I work on is really be willing to ask people what they want to see. A lot of times you have that inside of you, what you think people want, but you don't know until you really ask. So yeah, that's where, that's where we're getting a lot of value from right now. Yeah, I mean, they say haters going to hate, right? Haters going to hate. Haters going to hate, so just, you know, whatever. I mean, look, it, it's the first time you're doing it, and the price is so affordable. I mean, dude, anybody in any major metropolitan city uh, spends 149 199 bucks in a weekend, no sweat. Right. Hell, I'll spend that almost on parking going down to L.A. It's ridiculous. You know? yeah, yeah, if you're doing it right anyways. Yeah, I mean, good, just paying the toll on the 91 going into L.A., uh, I think it's about $199. It's crazy. Uh, but, you know, to be part of the first one, uh, you know, I think, I think you'll find people responsive or, um, um, you know, open and, and pretty laid back about it. And just the, the networking, you know, the, the speakers you already have lined up. Uh, it's worth it. So you know what? Tell those guys they're in Texas. Don't mess with Texas. All right. Yeah, don't mess with Texas. I, yeah, we need to get some shirts. Say don't mess with the podcast movement. Ooh, if that <laughs> if I could if I can talk to the attorney, see if we can get away with something like that. That's not a bad idea. I like it. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> uh, so so give us some. I don't know. I'm, I'm torn between asking you for some podcasting tips or just some entrepreneurial tips. I mean, because the things you're doing uh, are, are cool. And, and I like the fact, you know, hey, when, when I was, you know, what, 10 years ago, whenever I was your age, 10, you were 10 years ago, there wasn't video. There wasn't social media. So I'm kind of glad um, there's not video of me floating around between uh, 18 to 30 because uh, less people would come to my website. So you know what? Haters going to hate. Um, so what? give us some podcasting tips. What have you learned in the last year or two uh, doing this, and why do you feel so compelled uh, and so motivated uh, about podcasting? Yeah, so I, I go to a lot of the podcasts. We have a bunch of, or I say a bunch, a fair number of podcast meetups here in Dallas, and every time there's new people there really trying to figure out how they can get involved with podcasting. A lot of people show up and they – say they want a podcast, but they don't know what they want a podcast about, or they know what they want a podcast about, but they don't really know how to podcast. And, you know, you and I, we know of the John Dumas's and the Pat Flynn's and things like that. We know those are the places to go if you're really trying to learn. But somehow there's still all these people that are showing up at these meetups every week that they don't know those are the places to go to. So I really think creating events like this that really, if we can reach these other people that are maybe on the outside of our, this whole, this whole podcasting bubble and really bring more and more people into it. Those are people that they want to do it. They can benefit from it. So I really am enjoying meeting these people that, you know, I don't know, Wes, we run in similar circles in terms of the people we know and the people we talk to and associate with online, offline in terms of podcasters. But there's so many more people out there that can really benefit from all this knowledge that we're all, you know, kind of masterminding and sharing as we do all our things together. And this ability and this opportunity to pull people in, that's really what I'm enjoying about this. And I also think well, just just kind of my observation of the podcasting landscape right now that I really would like to see kind of evolve is there's just so much – so so many generic podcasts out there, so many people trying to be everything to everyone, really doing this, you know, I'm going to target all entrepreneurs or I'm going to target everyone who has a dream or, you know, you hear all these things like that. And I really think that what I try to preach to people is there's a ton of value in niching down because all of us, we're, we're looking at John Dumas and these people that are making lots of money based on sheer volume. But I really think there's also a huge opportunity to make 
uh, make money in podcasting by niching down. There are so many of these small businesses out there that might be perfect fits for sponsorships of podcasts or perfect fits of advertising on on niche websites, you know, real brick and mortar businesses that if you have a niche podcast that caters to those people, that's a perfect opportunity. You know, if I were to be passionate about an accounting podcast, there's so many accounting, you know, online accounting companies out there, online accounting software companies that a podcast about accounting would target their key demographic, the people they're trying to hit. And right now they have no way to reach people through podcasting because there's nothing focused specifically on their target market. So I really think a lot of people think that when they get into podcasting, they have to just try to get so, do something that attracts as many people as possible. But if you really focus down and think about it from a, a from a perspective, you'll probably enjoy it more because you're doing specifically what you're interested in, and you know not worrying, you know taking the money out of the equation for a minute. But when you put it back in, it, there there's tons of uh, marketability about that as well. And that's that's the one thing I went to one of my meetups recently was about you know monetizing your podcast. That's what so many people want to do, and it's really frustrating to hear people in there say things like. Well, I really want to do my podcast about this, but after hearing your talk, I don't think I'll be able to get an advertiser for it. And I think that 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 frustrates me, and I try to communicate to these people that that's not the case at all. Because if that were the case, most podcasts wouldn't be around, you know, wouldn't be out there. If you look at iTunes right now, most of those podcasts aren't targeted for Audible.com, or they're not great fits for. You know, audiobooks.com or Squarespace, but I think that podcasting right now we're just on the just on the cusp of real businesses, real brick and mortar companies, large companies really getting involved. That I think that short sighted thinking that people really should kind of reconsider that mindset. So that's that's kind of how I feel about the current uh, shape of podcasting right now, and I really think everything's just about to explode. Yeah, I think in general, most people just uh, don't have the longer term vision. Because no matter what, building a website, social media, doing direct mail marketing, buying a dang billboard, putting it on the side of the freeway, I mean, all of those things take time uh, to build some momentum. And, and yeah, you see guys uh, hitting a lick. You know, John will tell you he's, he's an anomaly. You know, people can't quit their job and go work for six months to build something and then launch it. And even when he launched it, it was uh, several months before it really started to take off. So, you know, he's looking at easily nine months of basically no income, uh, hoping that his idea would work. You know, and uh, and people see that and are like, yeah, I want to make $100,000 a month. I say, well, hey, don't we all? Uh, <laughs> right. You know, but what are you producing that's worthy of $100,000 a month in income. And, you know, until you lay that foundation, uh, it, it's just not going to happen, you know. And then there's so many things behind the scenes, right? And, and you're seeing it with with billing and web design and hosting and venues and scheduling. And, I mean, it, even though it's, we talk about podcasts, you still have to have a website, right? you got to have an autoresponder. So, um are you going to be helping people at Podcast Movement? I mean, kind of covering all the bases, all the nitty gritty uh, that, you know, the down and, and dirty that people really need to know about podcasting to make it work? Yeah, and that's one of the things that, and I keep going back to what we, you know, when we surveyed people that go to these other conferences, what they would like to see out of it. And one of the things they want to see are real defined tracks. Like, this is your beginner type class, or this is your expert type class, and really communicating to the attendee, the conference goer, what classes they're about to step into because I made the mistake a couple times at New Media Expo going into something that, you know, from the description and the title and the speaker, I thought it was going to be something more advanced. And then I, I sat in there and heard something that it was just, it was so basic and I didn't get anything out of it. But I was, you know, sometimes you get those conference rooms and you're all the way to the side and you're up against a wall on one side and you're, you've got <laughs> people, you know, you got 10 people to the right. Right, that you'd have to cross over and then the speaker's right in front of you so you'd have to cross right in front of them so you just end up sitting there for the whole time and and thinking about how great the other sessions are and because you didn't get the video ticket you're not going to have any chance to see what you're missing so what we really want to do is try to avoid things like that because we are going to have four different sessions going on at a time so we're going to focus on telling people and, and communicating very clearly yes this is a very basic thing or this is a, a technical type class and uh you know, to to your point, one of the one of the sessions is about using WordPress to to best suit your podcast, or, or utilizing WordPress best for your podcast. Um, so things like that 
that's just one example of something that maybe it's not specifically about sitting there and talking into a microphone for your podcast, but it really is about all those things that kind of surround the podcast. Because like you said, talking into the microphone, hitting record, hitting stop, that's kind of the, the beginning of it, but that's about a quarter of what actually goes into it, maybe even less, at least to make something successful. So we really are going to try to cover all the bases when it comes to podcasting and getting your podcast out there. Or, like I said, for the advanced podcaster, really having some, some specific topics to make it better, whatever you, know, whatever you feel your weakness is. Uh, what are you saying as some, uh, some little tips? I mean, what are, what are mistakes people are always making that you kind of scratch your head and say, everybody, look, don't do these one or three things or make sure you always do these one or three things uh, when launching your podcast? Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the things I would say, and this might be a little off topic, but the daily podcast is probably uh, overdone a little bit. I think a lot of people, we, I keep going back to this a little bit, a lot of people see John Dumas doing it and making $100,000, so they feel like they need to do a daily podcast. And then 20 days into it, they're so burned out that their podcast stopped altogether. Right. And I've seen this happen time after time after time. And some of them, I really like the podcast. There's a guy, um, uh, Vernon Foster, who does uh, the Event Supremacy podcast, which was perfect timing because he's an event organizer in, for, in Florida. And he was talking about organizing events, and I loved what he was doing. He was doing every day. And I was on his show early on, and I said, dude, you really need to rethink this everyday thing. I said, you're going to get burnt out. You're going to run out of gas. You're going to run out of material. And then you're going to stop. And I said, and you know, as selfish reasons, what you're doing is very important to me. So I don't want that to happen to you. And you know, a few weeks later, he, he went down and said, okay, I'm going to go maybe three days a week now. I'm getting a little tired of going seven days a week. And then now, then he went down to one day a week and now he hasn't put out an episode for a month. And I see that time and time again. And so that that would be my first thing is is really don't do it unless that's what you want to do. And a lot of people are doing it for the other the wrong reasons. Like I said, looking at John Dumas or something like that. Um, the other thing, kind of how I'm how I already mentioned, a lot of people are just staying too generic. And when I sit at that meetup group and I hear people give me their ideas, if I talk to five or six different people. Chances are four of them are – they want to interview entrepreneurs or they want to interview uh, change makers or all these things. There's just the same things over and over going on and a lot of people not being specific. And I know I already talked about that, but to me that's the biggest thing. I just feel like there's a flood of those generic podcasts but a, a lack of the specific actionable podcasts. So I really would like to see people be brave enough to kind of step outside the box and do something that no one else is doing. Well, we should start a wrestling CPA podcast. You know, no one else is doing that. Something tells me that the market for that is very, very small. In fact, I have yet to meet anyone else other than myself that falls into that category. Now, that's not saying that wrestling fans who aren't into accounting couldn't listen to it, although I don't think there's many of those. And accounting fans that aren't into wrestling, they could listen to it too. But I don't think there's many people that would want to do that either. So just, uh, you know, I'm going to be fair and unbiased here and say that. Maybe we open it up to include like Greco Roman wrestling, arm wrestling, and thumb wrestlers. Have you have you done a keyword search on that yet? I have not. So okay, a keyword search of all those at once. Yeah, you need to expand it. I, I think I think there's a niche there. I think there's people. They're waiting. They're waiting. You know, I uh, even I wouldn't listen to that man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, this is fantastic. So um, it is a little bit after six year time. Do you have uh, any parting words of wisdom for our listeners? Uh, you gave them some great ideas right there, but any other parting words of wisdom you might uh, feel compelled to leave our listeners with? Yeah, you know, I, I really think that one of the biggest lessons I've learned through all of this, through all these different projects going on, uh, I, I've had to cut out some things that I was doing in order to make room for the, putting on this podcast movement. And I've really learned how to guard my time way better. Uh, I used to say yes to everything and help everybody. And every email I would reply to with a long, thorough response, no matter what. And, you know, guys like that, that would email me and complain because I was a wrestler, former wrestler, putting on a conference and making it seem like there was something wrong with that. I would worry so much about it and put a lot of time into going back and forth with this guy. But I really have taking on a pro, you know, while I work full time and taking on a full time project like this as well, I've really learned to guard my time better. And I had to. Um, you know, let some people down along the way by 
having to tell them no after I told them yes just because all these other things I have going on. I got in too deep in terms of my time commitments. So I really would uh, warn people to maybe be looking for that on the front end. And if you say no before you say yes, you don't ever get in those awkward situations. You don't let anyone else down uh, for those reasons at least. So I think that's kind of the one thing that I've taken away from this whole process. And I'll be a lot more guarded with my time now and a lot more reluctant to say yes to everybody, even though I wish I could. I just can't anymore, and I know that's um, you know I, I hear all the all the big guys saying that, and I'm certainly not putting myself on the you know the Chris Brogan or the Pat Flynn or the you know Derek Halpern level, but now I can actually see what they all talk about when they say how they talk about how they used to reply to every email and they just can't anymore. Right. I I you know I can I can sense that now. So you know guard your time and and be ready to start guarding it early on instead of later. Yeah, you get to a point where if you just let everybody buy you a cup of coffee and just gave them 15 minutes, you would you would drink a lot of coffee. Well, you know, <laughs> I I still get a lot of the offers for uh, for beer instead of coffee, so that could uh it could it's it's more fun, but it could be worse as well. So Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you bring up a great point and you know, a lot of people listening to this may still be in corporate America. Their goal may be to go out on their own. Uh, but and, and they think their job is a drag, it's holding them back, it's a curse, it's an anchor. But, you know, recognize the blessing that it is. Uh, a, it's giving you income for the moment. But, B, just because you're busy uh, doesn't mean you can't be successful. And, you know, and to the contrary, the, the busier you are, as long as it's effective busyness, right, not just busy, busy, um, and it makes you get focused. And, you know, when you are focused and you've got to be efficient, you can get a lot of stuff done, right? You just may not be able to watch as many uh, episodes of Dancing with the Stars, uh, but you're going to get meaningful work done. Uh, and that, uh, I bet now, as you look back the last six months or a year, I, I bet you don't have any regrets, huh? No, no, I don't. And it's, it's funny you talked about Dancing with the Stars. I know a lot of people who say, oh, well, I don't watch TV because that's a waste of time. I, you know, I'm always working on the computer on my business or something like that. But then you see him sharing like the latest funny cat video off YouTube or something like that. So, so you know what? That counts as watching TV too. That's also just because you're not sitting in front of the television. If you're in front of your com- computer screen, that's a big time suck too. So I see a lot of people falling into that, uh, into that trap as well. Yeah. Well, are, you, are you are you a funny cat video guy, Wes? I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that statement. Yeah, I think. Uh, hey, listen, this is my podcast. I'm asking you the questions. <laughs> Don't be. T- uh, that was like a double reverse, double whammy. T- uh uh-uh. uh. That what, okay. Two point deduction for low blow. That. Uh, yeah, you know what? You know what? In, in pro wrestling, that's that's kind of allowed now. As long as the referee uh, doesn't see it, and you're not the referee, I don't know who uh, is, but you're, you're the one that took the low blow. So sorry about that, Wes. Dang. Changing the rules. i got to read up on my wrestling. All right. Uh, well, hey, man, where can people find you? What's the best place to find you online? You know, you can head over to danfranks.me, and that will point you to all the different projects I've got going on in the past, present, or future. And uh, you can get in touch with me from there as well. And, uh, and then your website for Podcast Movement is podcastmovement.com. Very simple, very easy right there. You can see a list of speakers, a rough schedule of what's going to happen, buy tickets, check out information on the event, and uh, all of that. And if they, in, if they enter promo code Wes Schaefer, they get to pay twice the price, right? Well, you know, I was going to go with that, but I figured that might not be fair. So if they enter <laughs> promo code Wes, they can save 15%. How about that? Man, what a giver. Very cool. Yeah, there you go. So I, I hope to see the Wes Schaefer fans there, and they can wear their uh, Don't Mess With Podcast Movement shirts, and they can drink their tequila shots outside. Uh, we have long breaks, so you can definitely take your shots outside and come back in and not Be a miss bunch a thing. Of, bunch of walking zombies, dude. <laughs> you know what? They won't put up much of a fight when Chuck Norris comes in. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Dan Franks all the way from Texas. Thank you, sir. This has been fantastic. Wes Schaefer, California. It's been fun. All right, man. Have a good night. All right. Thanks. You too. Lots of lessons learned there. Huh? The coolest thing I like about this, you know, Dan is still relatively young, uh, but he partnered with people with more experience than him. Uh, but he's moving forward aggressively uh, to bring about events that he's interested in, but they, they saw a need and they're filling it. And at the end of the day, that's what being an entrepreneur and a business owner is all about, you know, knowing that there's an itch and knowing where to scratch. 
And that's exactly what he's doing despite his, and probably because of his um, unique eclectic uh, background, you know, web design for wrestlers, becoming a wrestler, becoming a CPA, working with a cool company that gives him a chance to uh, expand uh, and broaden his horizons. He's passionate about podcasting. Uh, He's running in the right circles. He's putting himself out there, uh, going to trade shows, meeting people, brainstorming and pulling the trigger and riding the bullet, right? So they're making things happen. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, feel free to visit podcastmovement.com, enter promo code WES, uh, and save 15% uh, on this inaugural event. You know, I recommend you attend. Uh, it will be, uh, it, it'll be great just to be part of the first one. But the people that are already going, uh, it's going to be a great event, even though it'll be hot in Texas. You know what? There's air conditioning in the hotels. Uh, and as always, I thank you for listening. Uh, if you're interested in growing your sales, uh, visit 30daysalesgrowth.com, enter promo code podcast, and save $30. And thanks for listening again. And remember to sell different.